Well, the Lord be with you. If you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, would you turn with me? We are going to be looking at 2 Kings chapter 2, and we're going to be covering verses 1 to 14 this morning, which means we're going to continue this series looking at the days of Elijah. And as we've been working through this series, we've seen so many different events that occurred in the life of this mighty prophet. If you will recall at the very beginning when he was called, he was called at a very unique time in Israel's history for we see that king after king was doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And Elijah was called at Israel's all-time low moment spiritually. They were experiencing a spiritual drought in which they found the worst king of them all in King Ahab, who not only was bad enough as making Baal worship a state-sponsored event, but he actually marries Jezebel, a evangelist for Baal worship. And so we see that with this wicked king and his wicked wife, they make Israel a terrible, wicked nation. And at this point, Elijah is called to go and speak before the king, declare that there will be a devastating, deadly drought that will occur in the land of the northern kingdom of Israel. And this drought lasts for three and a half years. And this makes it super difficult to live in this nation as we see that without the water, we lose all of the crops and the the cattle supply, and this allows many people to become impoverished and to die out of starvation. And in this, during this period of time, we see that though uh, the nation is struggling, we see that God continues to provide for his prophet. And so we see that Elijah goes and lives by this Cherith brook, and there we see that God provides by um, giving him water to drink through the brook, as well as feeding him day and evening with ravens bringing him food. We then see during this period of time, he also goes to Zarephath, which is enemy territory, literally um, in the area of where Jezebel is literally from. And we see that God once again provides for his prophet in unexpected ways by bringing a widow to him. And there he goes and lives in the house of this widow where God provides a meal that will not run out for him and this family. And then, of course, we know that there was this great showdown at the end of the three and a half years where Elijah is called to go once again to Ahab and calls the king as well as 850 prophets of Baal. They meet on Mount Carmel for the showdown of the gods where each of them are calling to their own gods, asking God to answer by fire. And we see that only Elijah's God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, answers by fire. And because of that, we see 850 prophets of Baal are slaughtered. We see that the king and Elijah then run to Jezreel. And we think that maybe the story would have ended there. But of course, we saw that Jezebel decided that she was going to commit her life's mission to ending the life of Elijah the prophet. And because of that, Elijah actually is taking off guard and actually seems to experience some type of spiritual depression where he runs into the wilderness. He hides and he actually ends up getting to the point where he, he calls to God and asks God to take his life because he is all alone in this fight, it feels to him. But we see that God gives Elijah a mission in the wilderness, that God continues to speak life and to provide for his prophet. And he says, I want you to go back to the northern kingdom because this fight is not over, and I still have a plan and a purpose for you. And with a still small voice, he tells him to go and appoint these new leaders who are going to be the next generation, are going to continue this fight and bring revival to the nation of Israel. And one of those successors is going to be Elisha the prophet. And that's where we left off last time, if you remember, where Elijah is walking and he sees this capable, uh, wealthy, well-off man, Elisha, who is, who is plowing his fields and he has all of these oxen. And we see that Elijah walks by him and puts on his mantle, that is uh, his outer garment, his cloak on top of Elisha as he's plowing and working the field. And then Elijah just continues on his path walking. And Elisha most likely is aware of Elisha and what has happened this past three and a half years as we've seen him battling against the king and the prophets and of course this great drought that has occurred. And Elisha recognizes the symbolic significance of the mantle being placed on him because this is meaning that he is calling him to follow him, 
to be his disciple and that he is going to share this prophetic power and authority with Elijah. And so what Elijah does when he, he, he gets this call, he immediately forsakes his family, his, his oxen, his wealth, all of the, the comforts of life, and he chases after Elijah. And it says that at that moment, he begins to serve him, to follow him, and to study under him. Well, that was in 1 Kings chapter 19, where we le- uh, last left off. And so if you notice now with us being in 2 Kings chapter 2 this morning, a lot has happened since then. In fact, we see that this is probably going to jump about 10 years in the future. So about a decade long now where Elisha has been walking with, serving, and studying under the prophet Elijah. But in the past few chapters, what we've seen happening is that the focus seems to shift towards specifically King Ahab. Because remember, he's still around after Elijah had run away and then has come back and has been bringing and appointing these new leaders in Elisha and some of these other individuals that are going to be appointed. But Ahab seems to still not understand the significance of his own sin. And though he seems to make some moments of partial repentance. We see that he just gradually continues to make bad choice after bad choice. And ultimately, it results in his own death. We see that there is this battle between him and and Syria, and he is asking the prophets of the Lord, should he go to battle with them? Will they be victorious? And there's all of these false prophets who have been saying, yeah, this is going to be your victory. You're going to, you're going to win if you just go to battle. And we see that there's this other king who doesn't really trust what the prophets are saying and recognizes that these are false prophets that only speak favorable towards the king. And so he asks, is there any other prophet that we can speak with? And he's like, well, there is one other, but I hate him because he always speaks bad against me. And he's like, well, let's go and, and let's, let's hear what this prophet has to say. And ultimately we see that this prophet says that if you go to battle, you're going to die. So Ahab, hearing this, rejects this word of the Lord and decides he's going to try to, you know, um, hide himself and and wear a certain costume to, you know, kind of deceive them so they wouldn't know that he is the king that's there in battle. And we find that the word of the Lord, once again, is true. And a rogue arrow actually strikes Ahab, which leads to his death. And then this then results in his son, Ahaziah, becoming the king. And we see that once again, this is another wicked king doing evil in the sight of the Lord, who once again tries to go up against Elijah and actually sends men trying to kill Elijah. But we see that once again, God protects, provides for his prophet. And we see that Elijah is just continuously being victorious over these forces of darkness. So, with that being said, then we have King Ahab dying by, the, by an arrow. We see Ahaziah, his son, also then dying. And then we see that Elijah and Elisha are continuing to do the work of ministry. And so that's where we are picking up then this morning. But what we're finding here is that we're finding Elijah on his last day on earth. We're finding that after all of these years of going against the kings, against the prophets, doing these mighty works of God, and now leading Elisha along in discipleship, we find him where he is about to be raptured, where he's going to ascend from the earth to heaven. And you see this actually in verse 1 where it says, And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And so that's what's picking up here is after Ahaziah now has died and we see that Elijah has continued to serve the Lord faithfully and do his purpose as leading and teaching Elisha, it says that now they are at the point where Elijah is done with his ministry. And so he is going to, or going from Gilgal, and God is giving him a word and saying, I want you to go from here now to Bethel. And at this point, what Elijah does is he tells Elisha basically, don't go any further with me. I'm going to continue on. God has, has something for me. But Elisha, he's not convinced of that. He says, no, wherever you go, 
I'm going to. And so he goes and he gets to Bethel. And as they're in Bethel, it says that there are these sons of the prophets who most likely these would have been students who were studying prophetic ministry, being able to understand the word of the Lord and are proclaiming it to the people of God. We see that these sons of the prophets come to Elisha in Bethel and they say, do you know that your master or that your teacher is about to go up? That he is about to depart from the earth? And Elisha, probably dealing with a variety of emotions here as he's, um, this has been revealed to him either by Elijah himself or by the Lord. Um, and we see that Elisha tells them, yes, I know, basically be quiet. He doesn't want to talk about it. Well, then after being in Bethel for a period of time, we then see that they move from Bethel to Jericho, where, where J- Elijah says that God is telling me to go further to Jericho, but you don't go with me any further. And Elisha, once again, says the same thing, where he says that I'm going to go with you wherever you go. And so they then get to Jericho, and it seems that it's a repeated story, where once again, we, we see these, these sons of the prophets who are basically saying, once again, do you know that your, your teacher is about to leave you, do, that he's about to ascend, that he's about to go to heaven? And he says, yes, I know, be quiet. And finally, one other time, we then see that the word of the Lord comes to Elijah, tells him to go now as far as to the Jordan River. And once again, Elisha tells him, you don't need to go with me. Stay here. I'm going to continue. And Elisha says, I am going with you. So they then get to the Jordan River. We see that Elijah takes off his mantle, which is the same cloak or outer garment that he put on Elisha to call him to discipleship. And it says that he, he rolls it up and it says that he strikes the Jordan River. And the Jordan immediately begins to part Think about the story of Moses and the Israelites in the Exodus, right, with the parting of the Red Sea. We see another parting or the parting of the Jordan when Joshua did it, when they first were entering the promised land. We see that Elijah parts the Jordan River and they walk across the river and it says on dry ground, which also, by the way, is just so amazing. Not only that God can part the waters, but also that even the land that had all the water on it is now completely dry as they are now walking across this together. And it says, as they are at the Jordan now, Elijah asks Elisha, what can I do for you before I go? He's offering him, that he said, there's one thing I will give you if you ask of it. And Elisha probably prepared for this question. As he's been walking with him, he's aware that Elijah is about to leave. And what we see is Elisha says that I would like a double portion of your spirit. That he wants a double portion of what God has been doing in Elijah. The ministry, this work that he's been doing. He wants to see God continue this ministry and do greater things through him. And Elijah, when he is asked of this, he says, this is a hard thing you've asked of me, and it's not my right to, to give this to you or not to give this to you. So what, this, what we'll do is we'll just continue on together, and if you see the Lord take me from the earth to heaven, then you will know that God has said that this will be done for you. But if I am to go and you don't see me, well, then it won't be done for you. And so it says that they continue on, and as they are literally just continuing on in conversation, just imagine what they probably would have been talking about, by the way, as they both know that there's just any day now, any moment where he's going to go to be with the Lord, and they've been doing all of these ministries, all of this stuff together, and then it says there's this moment where there's a chariot of fire, there are horses of fire, that they just immediately separate the two, where Elijah is just taken up in a whirlwind, up into the sky, up into the heavens, and Elisha is just standing there on the earth, just seeing all of this take place, and he immediately starts you know, yelling out, my father, my father, you know, the, the, the chariots of Israel, and it's horsemen. He's so excited and terrified and, and probably emotional because now his master, his teacher is leaving. And then after that, it's just immediately, he's gone. And then Elisha is left with a choice because he sees the mantle slowly coming back down to the earth and he picks it up. And as he picks it up, he's looking at the Jordan He goes to the Jordan and he asks this question. He says, where is the Lord? Where is Yahweh? 
the God of Elijah. And then he strikes the Jordan just like his teacher did before him. And then we see once again the Jordan parting. This Jordan River is probably getting exhausted with how many times it has to work for all of these different prophets and leaders. But the Jordan once again parts and it says, and Elisha walks through the waters alone now to continue the work. He crosses over again. So we see this story where Elijah now on his final day is is raptured to heaven, leaving Elisha to continue the work of ministry. So as we think about Elijah's life and we think about this story and the relationships between these two prophets, what can we learn or or take away from it? The, The first thing that I want to draw your attention to is I think we see in this account is that discipleship is a full-time commitment. In verses 1 to 2, as well as verse 4 and 6, I want to read this for us again. It says that it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel, But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Verse 4, then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. And then finally, in verse 6, then Elijah said to him, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Now, you might be wondering to yourself, why does Elijah want Elisha to leave him alone, right? You might be thinking, well, this is kind of harsh. They've been doing ministry together for a decade. He's been studying under him. He views him to be a father in the faith. This is his spiritual son in the faith. And now, on his final day, he's saying, hey, I'm going over here. Please stay here. Don't, Don't go with me. Well, some might think that this is because Elijah just wants to be alone. Maybe he's processing some of these things emotionally as he's about to go on and be in the presence of the Lord. And though I think that that is a possible reading, I think that actually there's something more significant going on here. I think what Elijah is doing is he is giving his his student one final test. He is wanting to see how committed Elisha is to him to the Lord, and to the work of ministry. And so he gives him time after time the opportunity to say, you know what, I am going to stay here. I'm going to rest. And so you see this in Gilgal, in Bethel, in Jericho, and then finally they're at the Jordan together. This is miles and miles uh, of walking together. Sometimes we just think, okay, he went to here, then he went to here. But a lot of these are like 15 plus miles away from one another, and you're not driving there. I know that sometimes whenever you've been busy for a day, after you've gone in and out, you've been traveling, doing all these different chores and different things you need to do around the house and, and, and you know, some other things you need to do, errands you have to run, eventually you're just worn out from all of the, the traveling, and especially they're, they're meeting with these other prophets and these other students. Then it's very easy that he could have been like, you know what? Today has been a long day. I'll meet up with you maybe in another day or so. Um, So yeah, I'm going to take a break here. But instead, what we see is that Elijah went wherever Elijah went. Elijah was not going to let his teacher get out of his sight. He was fully committed to his teacher. And if you just see the way that he continuously responds to Elijah, when Elijah says that, you know, I'm going to go on, please stay here, you you see how he regularly says, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Isn't that great to hear someone speak like that to another? What if we were like that for one another? What if we had that type of commitment for one another in this life, to do ministry as a, as a family of the people of God. And it reminds me of when Ruth speaks to Naomi in Ruth 1.16. It says, But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, 
are to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. This is the same type of heart and commitment that we see with Elisha and Elijah, where he was committed to his teacher to the very end, the very last moments he was sticking by his teacher. And I think that this is teaching us that God is not looking for part-time disciples. Luke 9, 57 to 58, it says, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I'm wondering, as we think about this story with Elisha and Elijah, is what would have happened if Elisha, when he first got the mantle, was really excited about it and went with him for a season, but then as life got hard and there were these kings and other individuals coming after them, trying to kill them, and they were on the run and they had to work long hours, if eventually he's like, you know what? It was a lot easier back at home. It would have been so much better to just go back, work, plow my field, you know, be with my family and and, and the comforts and the familiarity of life. But instead, we see that Elisha is a picture for us of how we are to follow Jesus. Because not only was he excited in the beginning, was he willing to forsake wealth and comfort of the past, but we also see that he continues on. And he doesn't get cold as the journey continues. He doesn't start to say, you know what? I know that I've done a lot in the past, and now somebody else can pick up the work. I've already done a lot. I don't need to continue working anymore. Somebody else surely is going to come and do some of this work as well. Rather, he he doesn't have that mindset, does he? Think about all of these opportunities. Easily, you could logically rationalize, I have some right to stay in Gilgal for a while. I've been working for over 10 years in ministry. I've done way more than most people in Israel. So now I'm going to take some time and I'm going to rest. Or you know what? I have some friends or some family or some loved ones over in this area. When we go there, I'm going to go and spend some time there. But instead we see that every time he's given the opportunity, he says, no, I'm with you. I'm following you. Is that how we look at our own spiritual life following Jesus? Or are we, are we trying to take the easy out when opportunity arises? That I know that Jesus is calling me to do this. He wants me to be serving and being active in the church and in my communities, but I see that I have this out. I have this excuse. See, Elisha would not settle for comfort or wealth. And I wonder, do we view ourselves as more of an Elisha type? Are we full-time disciples? Or are we more of the part-time disciple? Are you that person that really when it comes to being a disciple, this is it, Sunday morning is your discipleship? Or do you view your entire life as being a part of your discipleship following Jesus? If every single church member was going to follow in your footsteps, when it comes, comes to your church um, attendance, when it comes to the way that you give to your church, when it comes to how you serve your church, when it goes to how you share the gospel and serve your community, if every single church member was going to look at you and they were going to do exactly how you do it, how well would your church, your home, and your community do? That will let you know whether or not you are a part-time, one who's putting in a little bit of effort, a little bit of work, or if you're someone that's full-time. The way that you look at every aspect of your life is how am I following Jesus in this context? Because here's the thing, Jesus is not looking for, he's not hiring part-time right now. Have you ever been looking for a job and you're like, all I can do right now is part-time? And they're like, I'm sorry, we don't have any part-time positions available. All we have is full-time. And you're like, oh, well, I can't do that. Well, here's the thing. Jesus is only looking for full-time. 
And so if you're someone that's kind of half in, half out, if you're not wholeheartedly devoted to discipleship, then Jesus says, well, then you're not my guy. You're not my girl. The work of ministry requires full-time commitment. And what we see here is that if you are someone who hears that call of discipleship and you're in it for the long haul and say, I'm going to go wherever Jesus leads and I'm going to do whatever Jesus says for me to do, then what we also see in the text is that God rewards bold and unwavering faith. We see that Elisha would not be shaken. When Elisha tried to move this way, he was going with him. And then whenever it finally gets to the point where Elijah's like, I'm giving you something, what would you like? He asks a bold. He, he, he asks for something big. He's going to boldly ask, hey, this is what I want. You have this awesome spirit that you have been able to do so much for the kingdom of heaven and for our God, and I want a double portion. I want you to do double in me. That's what I want, which is so interesting, by the way. He could have asked for comfort. He could have asked for wealth, but instead his mind was on the kingdom. His mind was on what God was doing in the nation of Israel through his prophets. And so that is what he desired. And and you might be thinking, well, why is he mentioning a double portion? Well, this is actually referencing Deuteronomy 21, verse 17, which was literally the rule of the inheritance of the firstborn son. There was a right that the firstborn actually had where his father would give an inheritance to his son and it would always be a double portion. And so what Elisha then is doing, not only is he saying that I want to continue the work of ministry, but he's also saying I view uh, view Elijah to be my father spiritually. That's the type of relationship that they have with one another. And so he's viewing this as, this is my inheritance. Your ministry is my inheritance. And so he asks for this, and we see that whenever he witnesses Elijah being taken up to heaven, that God is confirming to him that he will be rewarded, that he will be given what he has asked for. And then he's able to perform the exact same miracle that Elijah does by parting the Jordan River. And so as we think about God rewarding Elisha here, how much more then will he reward his church who keeps their faith in the Lord, who will petition him, ask bold and big things of our God because we are promised in his word that we have a greater inheritance in Christ. Think about this. Elisha was getting an inheritance from Elijah, a prophet. Our inheritance is being a joint heir with Christ, the Son of God. That is your inheritance. If you persevere in faith, if you continue on your journey of discipleship, the promise is that you are given Christ's inheritance. And so we see, I think, this, this encouragement to persevere in discipleship and to recognize that it's not a one-time event, it's not a, a occasionally, but it's a full-time commitment. And if you continue in faith, we see that God rewards our faith. But we also see in this text that death is not the end for believers. Death is not the end for believers which this is once again is a part of our inheritance in Christ that we know from the new covenant. But you see in the story this kind of a solemn feeling between Elisha and Elisha as we are seeing them walk on Elijah's final day. And I think what we see in this text is that goodbye is never easy. Have you ever had to say goodbye to a loved one? I know many of us have had to say goodbye at times. And, and this could be goodbye in the sense of a loved one is passing away to someone is going to a new school, a new job, a country. It could be even a pet. Someone may have had a pet and they've had to say goodbye to a loved one, a companion. And what we find is that when we have to say goodbye to loved ones, it is not easy. It can be actually very hard. And in fact, this is showing us how death and separation really plague the human race. This is something that we alone really deal with as creatures. And I think this is what Elisha is starting to experience in this story. 
Because if you notice in verse 3 and verse 5, every single time it's brought up to him that Elijah is about to leave, you see how Elisha responds. He says, I know, be quiet. I don't want to talk about it. He's literally getting, staying as close as he possibly can to Elijah, and anytime someone wants to talk about him leaving, he doesn't want to talk about it. Have you ever been that person with maybe you know someone's about to, like I said, someone's about to move and you're kind of just in that, you know, you're hanging out with them in your final time and you know it's your final time, but you don't really want to talk about them leaving yet. You don't want to say goodbye. Or maybe, like I said, you have someone that's sick or, or, or a pet that's about to pass and you know that they're at that final leg of life and you're just kind of there in that moment, but you don't really want to talk about the separation that's about to occur. I'm sure many of us have felt that and know what that's like, and I think that this is what Elisha, once again, was dealing with in this moment. But I think we're still encouraged in this story, though there may have a little bit of a a shadow of the solemnness with it. I think we are reminded, once again, that death bows before God's power. Death bows before God's power, because our God is a God of the living, In Mark 12, verses 26 to 27, it says, But concerning the dead, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Now, this should give us such a great comfort to our souls, that though we sometimes look at death as the end, we have to recognize that our God is not a God of the dead. Our God is a God of the living. And those who are in the presence of God are more alive than we could possibly imagine. We think that this is what life feels like, but this is a shadow of true life to come in the presence of God of our God, to be in glory before the throne, seeing the angelic beings and being in the presence of the ancient of days. I can't imagine what that type of life is like, but that is true for every single believer who goes and passes from this life to the next. And what that means then is that though we we use the term goodbye a lot, for believers, goodbye is really just see you later. That's literally what it is. If you are a believer and if someone that you love is a believer, it's never really a goodbye. It's always I will see you later. And I think this is what Elisha was being reminded here because his teacher doesn't even actually die, right? He never even tastes death. Rather, he goes from life on the earth to direct life in the presence of God. And there's only one other individual in all of Scripture that got to experience what Elijah experienced, and it's Enoch in in Genesis 5, 24. It says, And Enoch walked with God, And he was not, for God took him. That's so mysterious. It's one little verse about Enoch. We know that he was a guy who was in fellowship with God. He was walking with God on the earth, and there's just this other moment where he was not. God just takes him from earth and puts him in his presence in heaven. And it's amazing. I think that these stories though they're kind of mysterious and and maybe a little fantastical as we read them, I think it's important that we see here that Elijah's ascension foreshadows our future. If you are a believer, if you are a part of the church, what you see happening in Enoch's story or in Elijah's story is literally your story. It's what we have to look forward to in the future because what we are reminded of is that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he wasn't raptured before death. Rather, we know that Christ willingly tasted death, didn't he? Jesus came, experiences death, and then he rose from the dead. He conquered death through the cross, through crucifixion, and through his resurrection. And whenever he did depart and he ascends to heaven, 
He says, I am coming back. And whenever I come back, things are going to change. And you have something that you are to look forward to, that you are to be comforted by, and here are these words that we, as the church, are to be comforted by in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. Just picture how similar this is to what happens with Elijah. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, regardless of your eschatological position of when, and how this occurs, and what happens next after this event, all believers must affirm that there is a rapture that will happen. That is what's being, occur- or being described here in this text, where the people of God will ascend into the clouds to meet their Lord. That means you, if you are a believer, this is going to happen to you. When Christ returns, anyone who has gone to sleep, that is, who has died in the faith, they will be raised first, and then those who were alive on the earth will be raptured. Some of you are afraid of heights. Well, get ready. That means you. You are going to ascend above the mountain peaks. You're going to be up in the air, and you're going to see a lot of your friends and family here who have either gone to be with the Lord already or are with us right now in the church family, we're going to be going up raptured to our Lord. And in this moment, we're going to be transformed. We're going to be made perfect. No longer are we going to experience corruption. We will um, receive glorified, incorruptible bodies, eternal life with Jesus Christ. And we will be with him forever. And we're to be comforted by this. That's what Elijah, I think, is foreshadowing. This is one man going from the earth to be in heaven with the Lord. This is saying, we as the church will get to go up, ascend, to be with the Lord, and we will be with him forever. That's just a taste of the greater reality that is found in Christ. And that's why we then can celebrate and know that death is not the end for those who believe. We have a great truth that if we walk with God like Elijah, if we have faith in God like Elijah, that we will not be put to shame, but rather we will rise. We will ascend, and we will have everlasting life in Jesus Christ. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 57, it says this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory." O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is us proclaiming the good news of what Christ has done. That death is nothing to those who believe. We overcome death death by the power of Jesus Christ. There is no pain. There is no sting of death. Once again, there is no true goodbye in death. Rather, it is see you later. It's you're moving to a better place and I can't wait to get there with you. 
That's what it is. In this little moment where we see Elisha going from the earth and going to heaven, that's just a picture for us to remind us that our God is greater than death. God is not bound. He's not limited by what happens at the grave. In fact, he can take someone and put them directly in heaven if he wants them. And he can change and he can resurrect us if we pass before Christ returns. So I think we can be comforted by this story and recognize that death is not the end for believers. And finally, we see in verses 13 to 14 that God continues his work. God's work will continue. It's interesting, in verses 13 to 14, we see that Elisha, after losing Elisha, he, he's trying to wrestle with his own emotions and, and figure out what must he do next. And what we see here is his choice. He's, it says, he also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elisha that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. It's so interesting that what we see here is that he asked this question, where? is the Lord God of Elisha. And the point here is that Elijah is gone, but his God will always be here. Just because Elijah left and he's in heaven, his work is is complete on the earth. That doesn't mean that God is finished. That doesn't mean that his God has left him. In fact, his God is ever more present with Elisha in this moment. And so what we see Elisha do, rather than pack his bags and say, well, I guess we're done here because this giant of the faith is now gone, he picks up the mantle, picks up the power, the authority of the prophet, he strikes the Jordan parts the Jordan, crosses the Jordan, and then he continues the mission. That's how we are to view our lives. Just because someone that you respected in the faith has passed on and gone to be with the Lord, just because maybe you're getting a little bit older, that doesn't mean that God is finished with you. That doesn't mean that God's work is complete. Rather, God's work continues. And if you are still breathing, if your heart is still beating, that means that you still have work to do. The Lord should find us busy on the day he returns or on the day that he calls us home. That's why I love this story of Elijah and Elisha because what you see here is that Elijah on his very last day is still going from village and town to town and to village because he knows I'm going to serve the Lord until it's time. I'm going to see the prophets. I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to test my my disciple. I'm going to make sure he's ready to go. He is working until his final breath on the earth. And likewise, Elisha, he says, I'm not missing a beat. As soon as Elisha's gone, I'm going. Here's a miracle immediately. You wouldn't think you're going to see two parting of the Jordan River in the same story. But it happens back to back, and these other prophets that are watching back are like, what is going on here? God's work continues. He doesn't miss a beat just because someone, one saint goes to heaven. We continue the work of ministry because what we see here is that when Jesus was about to ascend, He says to his church that we are his witnesses, that we are to go therefore and make disciples, and it says that he has has all authority, and he is now bestowing that authority to his people. So what that means is that we are called to take up the mantle of Jesus Christ on the earth. He has given us his power, his spirit, and his authority. Once again, Elisha had the spirit of Elijah. We have the spirit of, Cl- of Christ living in us. So let us go and let us be active in the work of ministry. Say, how can I continue to do the work of the Lord in my church, in my home, in my community? How can I be more committed in my setting of the word, in my prayer life, how I serve and advance the gospel? These are the questions we have to be asking ourselves. It's not just for Elisha or Elisha. It's for us, the church. We have to hear this call to work and know that our God who empowers us will continue to be with us. 
God is working right now in this community. He's working throughout all of the nations. The question is, are you going to be like Elisha and hear the call to continue his work? I pray that we would. I pray that we would see how discipleship is a full-time, a lifelong commitment, how death is not the end for those who believe, and finally, that God's work will continue until Christ returns.